Your emotions are clouding your judgment. I will not leave her fate up to others. It's time to go. I do not believe that Ahsoka could have fallen so far. Welcome back to part three, the finale of the complete life of Plo Koon, pulling from every resource available to understand the final years of his life as he saw the ethics of the Jedi Order, the Republic, and its citizens all slowly being dragged into darkness. Even he would see how one could fall to the greatest deception, the thought of using the dark side to bring about good. We left off with the capture of Boba Fett. They could call that rescue mission a success, but now moving into 20 BBY, a mysterious new threat was killing Jedi across the galaxy. Plo would be a part of the team that took over custody of the bodies from Delta Squad. Not everything is what it seems. There may be a new threat. Someone or something has eluded us. Perhaps a newly appointed Sith Lord. But Kenobi recognizes that the wounds do not have the markings of a saber, or the precision of one who took pride in the Sith martial arts. They seem to have been torn apart by a beast. They did not yet know about Dooku's new apprentice, Savage Opress, and that this demon would haunt them over the following year. And they learn that Master Peel had been captured and was being held at the Citadel on Lola Seyu. Blo leads the briefing starting with the site itself. As you are aware, the Citadel is their most isolated and impenetrable detention facility. No one has ever escaped. Going on to explain that they can't even get close enough to gain intel, and why this mission was so important. He obtained the coordinates of a secret hyperspace lane known as the Nexus Route, which travels into the heart of both the Republic and Separatist homeworlds. In a war with hyperdrive tech, the only thing that prevented the enemy from what would feel like teleporting from one part of the galaxy to the other, right over your home world, was the restriction of hyperspace lanes. If the CIS got access to the Nexus route, they could go from deep in CIS territory and pop out over Coruscant. Knowing the fate of the entire war was riding on this mission, Ahsoka assumes she is coming. You two have much to discuss. He tells her this was an older public creation that was intended to keep Jedi prisoners should they ever lose their way. It was too dangerous for any Padawan. As the rest were preparing, she goes to talk to Uncle Plo, confiding in him while he cleans the Blade of Doran that Anakin was holding her back out of fear of losing her, and she felt that she should be the one that was able to risk her own life. He agrees and makes sure that her path is clear so she could choose her own fate, to become frozen in carbonite after the rest of the strike force was already sealed away. He then oversees the loading of the crew and takeoff, praying that the Force be with them on this most dangerous mission of the Clone Wars. Just like years earlier, Anakin's old trick worked and they were able to pass through the lifeform scanner, and once thought out, Anakin explains in a way that would have made Plo proud, showing that the Council's pairing worked perfectly, that Skywalker was getting his taste of a rebellious Padawan, while still making sure Ahsoka's clever and brave spirit was not eclipsed by Anakin's fears. If there's one thing I've learned from you, Master, it's that following direct orders isn't always the best way to solve a problem. All while the Council was forced to wait in darkness, going several hours before any status update. Plo is quick to bring the other Masters in and explains that their forces were being separated, but had freed even Peel, and were now making their way to evac. But on the landing pad, disaster would strike. The transport was hit by laser cannon fire, causing an explosion that consumed Echo and sent shrapnel everywhere, forcing them to make a hasty retreat. As they sprint through the cave systems, they update the Council and are told that a fleet would be sent to rescue them. Plo was already en route when they were called back for an update on the landing zone. Your rendezvous point will be this island. As the Venators appear, they see the Lucre Hulk and six Providence-class Dreadnoughts making up the blockade. There is a calm before the storm as fighter squadrons are deployed, and for this crucial mission, the Delta Sevens are being led by Sacy Tin, while Plo would ride with the gunships, coordinating all their forces. There have not been battles like these since the days of the Old Republic. Indeed. Good hunting. The incoming fire is so intense that Tin recommends peeling back and trying again, but Plo orders them to continue. The time was running out as the strike team was being overwhelmed. The never-shaken Keldor greets them with a joke in the face of near-certain death. I believe you've worn out your welcome. And with fighter escort, they make it back to the ship, Plo coordinating with Admiral Coburn to make sure the timing was perfect, turning to use the aft of the lead ship as cover as they set down in the Venator's hangar before disappearing into the void. Of Master Peel's laws, we are sorry you hear. Because of his great sacrifice, we now have the Nexus route coordinates. And we see a flash of the growing struggle between the Supreme Chancellor and Jedi Order, as Peel told Ahsoka to only tell her half of the coordinates to the Jedi, while Tarkin would only tell his half to Palpatine. 
Yoda moves to join the army man and ensure that the Nexus Point was recorded, and that Master Peel did not die in vain. Before they retire to their chambers, Anakin asks Plo if he really told Ahsoka that she could go on this mission, and his response was true from a certain point of view. It appears I did. Before walking off with the mischievous little one. Immediately after this, Ahsoka would get an attempt at redemption on Felucia. This time, instead of being separated and disobedient to her master, she was side by side with him leading the assault towards an important Separatist base. Once they took the hill overlooking the target, Plo explains the next steps. I'll take the left flank. Skywalker attack the front gate. Ahsoka, you scale the back wall. We'll meet in the middle. Anakin would be at the 501st while Ahsoka was with the boys from the 104th. And as soon as he was in position, he checked to make sure everyone was ready, then gave the orders from the ATTEs to unleash their mass driver cannons, raining down artillery fire. This made the threat seem far off in the mountain range, and splitting them up made it so the Separatists were being hit from four different angles. Anakin's team waited for the droid units to file out of the front gate, springing on them once they were far enough out, which was Plo's sign to get over the sidewall, using the force while the wolf pack rocketed up on jetpacks. As soon as the droid sentries engaged him, Ahsoka moved right on cue and provided cover while the clones used grapple cables to storm their side. But she sensed there was some threat watching them in the jungle. Instead of ignoring it and focusing on the mission, her curiosity led her into the electroweb trap of a Trandoshan exotic game hunter. These three teams close in on their droid units, with Plo using sabers and force blows to work through the B1s and dwarf spider droids. The plan had worked perfectly, but Anakin sees that his Padawan is not there with them. He desperately gives orders to fan out and search the jungle, as Ahsoka is trying to stay alive and hiding out with others being brought to the moon of Trandosha. Anakin had stayed up all throughout the night, ordering more and more searches and trying to pick up on her presence in the Force. The following morning, Plo moves to console Anakin to explain that all of their intelligence agencies, both within the Jedi Order and Republic military, were diligently searching for any sign of her, but that the time had come for them to leave Felucia without her. Your emotions are clouding your judgment. I will not leave her fate up to others. It's time to go. The combination of genuine passion and effort, with the slightest raising of his voice as he sternly repeated his orders, to walking away to show that this was not a debate, all demonstrate how he was a master of calm and effective leadership, as getting Anakin to leave without Ahsoka would be one of the most difficult tasks in the entire galaxy. But the Chosen One also knew that Plo cared deeply for her as well. Days would pass with not even a clue to her whereabouts anywhere in the galaxy, but by now, Ahsoka had already been helping the survivors change their strategy from hiding to fighting, even killing the lead Trandoshan son during what was supposed to be a proud moment as he completed this hunting rite of passage. In the Jedi Temple, Blow tries to get Anakin to realize that this was a lesson from the Force, which would test the lessons the Master had been trying to instill in his Padawan, that while Ahsoka's abilities were being tested, it would be Anakin's belief in little Ahsoka that was under scrutiny. There was nothing he could do, no problem to solve. Whatever you're trying to say, Master Plo, just say it. I am suggesting that perhaps, if you have trained her well, she shall take care of herself. Nearly a week would pass before they finally received word from a Wookiee strike team that Ahsoka was safely on her way back to Coruscant. They still needed to be filled in on the details of how she led the others in flipping this most dangerous game on their hunters, all without any intervention from the Grand Army or the Jedi Order. And yet, the Padawan was safely back home. It is good to see you safe, little Soka. He turns to let Master and Padawan have their reunion, A Plo, Mace, and Yoda are standing close enough to eavesdrop. All I had was your training, and the lessons you taught me. Thank you, Master. They all see this as them both passing this lesson issued by the Force itself, and it was evident that the Chosen One was able to control his passions, to not use his will to try and dominate the natural will of the Force, an excellent sign that Anakin would be strong enough to resist the path of the dark side. Later this year, Adi Gallia would be captured by Grievous, and Plo led the rescue mission with a fleet of five Venators, ensuring that the Providence could not escape and he was leading the pack charging through the corridor, with Wolf leading a smaller team directly to Galia's location. Thanks for the rescue, Master Plo! What nobody expected was to run into Padme's droids. Their misadventure saw them going from pirates to space to separatist ships, all just to cross paths with Plo's forces in the middle of this high-risk rescue mission. And always the deadpan Joker, he sicks the talkative droid on his old friend. Well, I'm certain Wolf would love to hear about it. Ah, uh, actually, sir. Excellent. It wasn't long after this that the High Council would learn that the Gruta colony on Kiros was captured by the Separatists. 
Kenobi and Skywalker's forces were dispatched to eliminate the droid forces there, but they realized this was an operation led by the Zygerians. The ancient slavers, hoping that an alliance with Dooku could help them win the war and re-establish the galactic slave markets. After trying to infiltrate their homeworld Zygeria, all would be captured, but Anakin and Ahsoka were able to escape and get a message back to the council. Anakin located Rex and his master, and gave the all clear to Plo to send in the pack. Wolf leader to wolf pack. Accelerate to attack speed. This is Warthog. We're going in. Blade of Doran easily flies circles around the large turbolaser cannon defenses, but he is unable to cut them down due to their ray shielding. The Zygerian fighter craft deploy and were about to shoot down the Z-95 headhunters, but Plo had to show why he was considered one of the best pilots in the order. All seven, cut the engines! <laughs> and we see how he is utterly efficient with everything he does during combat, not wasting a second celebrating. Yeah! That got him! Good work, General! Keep your focus, Warthog. Watch out for those towers! All this time, Kenobi and Rex are trying to break free, and the Slave Master destroys the control panel that was needed to reverse the purge process that was about to drop the Togruta to their deaths in the pit. Plo is trying his best to break through the ray shield, but the light cannons on his nimble Delta-7 weren't strong enough. I cannot move the cruiser in for the rescue operation until those enemy cannons are destroyed. Anakin says he will try to turn their weapons against them, and Ahsoka comes up with a plan to have Admiral Coburn move the Arquinans into position. With Anakin taking control of the turbolasers, opening fire on the other towers, allowing the cruiser to make its descent. And with the help of the jetpacks, cables, and the force, the Togruta were all saved. Then Plo gives the word to purge this wretched facility, sending it into the pit. All gunships, fire! Once they are safely away through hyperspace, the Jedi reunite and go to speak with the leader of the colonists. And they are all proud of the Padawan's progress and quick thinking to save her people's lives. Ahsoka is the real hero. Without her creativity, I don't think we would have gotten your people to safety. The joy of this victory was quick to be replaced with the dread of a returning Sith Lord. The one thing the Council was certain of concerning the Phantom Menace that revealed itself 12 years earlier was that at least one of those Sith was dead. Yet the Council was now listening to the threat issued from Darth Maul, demanding that Kenobi come out to face him alone on the Outer Rim world of Raidonia. To make sure they took him seriously, the Zabrak executes an entire village, promising to do much worse. Plo agreed with Windu that this was an ambush, but the Force was telling Yoda to still send Kenobi, that an unlikely ally would appear. Maul's long-awaited revenge was not to be fought on fair ground. Maul had been attacked two-on-one back on Naboo. Now that beast that had been slaughtering Jedi, Dooku's new assassin, stepped forth. Now the odds were in his favor, and their combined strength were able to beat Kenobi unconscious. But the Force was always right. Ventress intervened not on behalf of Kenobi, but out of a mutual hatred of the Sith after she had been betrayed by Dooku. After one of the most intense saber battles of the entire war, Obi and Asajj narrowly get away via escape pod. Maul lets them live, hoping this will trick the Order into the next stages of his revival. At a nearby spaceport, Kenobi calls Cody for backup, and then the commander sees Ventress walking away. The general gives orders not to pursue, sensing that she may yet come back to the light. When he updates the council, Windu is pressing to create a specialized task force to hunt down the Zabrak immediately. Blow's suggestion is to add Master Bru Jun Fan, considered to be the greatest force combat wielder in the galaxy. His next move would be to contact his informants in the Coruscant Underworld. And two days later, they had tracked him down to a remote ice world, finding the ship abandoned, the dead bodies inside, and the obvious signs of lightsaber combat throughout. The strike team moves to search a nearby cantina and find everybody inside had been beaten or sliced to death. Blow notices the mark of the Scourge, a powerful gang in the Outer Rim, and Master Jun Fan sees there is a cave nearby. But Plo notes that there is a vast maze of caves. In one of them, Maul was explaining to his brother that it was time that they create their own faction. One that took advantage of the chaos created by the larger powers of the Republic and CIS. As they further explore the cave base, the Zabrak find a woman in the prison cells that claim to be royalty sold off to the thugs by her own brother, which he did in order to block her claim to the throne. Just then, they get an alert from the proximity sensor and see the strike team rapidly approaching. The Jedi tell their units to stay back and make sure nobody escapes, and as they storm the command center, Plo yells to release the woman and surrender. But with the press of a button, Wampus comes storming into the room, killing the nearest troopers and making an opening for the brothers to escape with their hostage. The martial artist was pounding away, while the Red Blades were dismembering the second squad. Maul knows they only have seconds to escape, and the Wampas catch up to Kenobi, while Plo and Jun Fan are surrounded. Plo tries to keep the troops' minds on the objective, to target the ship, 
Before they can board, Master Grotto steps up to cut him off, but is himself cut down when Maul's tactic of using the woman as a human shield stops the Jedi, only to take a blade through the abdomen. Kenobi had been force choked, and like all his missions before, Plo stops to take care of his allies instead of pursuing the enemy. The brothers do escape, and while the Padawan is still being consoled, Plo is already on to the next step, showing that the Keldor actually have excellent eyesight, even behind the goggles, for he had seen a small item dropped by the captured woman. He hands it to Jun Fan so he can use his telemetry skills, a unique trait that like Quinlan Voss and Cal Kestis, allows them to sense the item's past. He gets glimpses he can recognize as the planet Pleem's Nexus. Plo moves to Kenobi's side to tell him to sit this part out and let him finish the fight while he recovers. Obi-Wan agreed, but asks that he takes reinforcements. The call was made to Anakin, and the wounded were transferred to their command ship, before heading out to this strange world. When the sister returns with her black-robed escorts, the traitorous brother plays it cool for as long as he could, before Maul calls out the coward, slaughtering him, then the guards, and even the woman's beloved hound. She does respect her part of the deal, and gives up the brothers access to the family vaults. Dozens of crates full of gold bars and treasures are loaded up, and Maul says this will help fund the creation of their criminal empire. But as they race out to their ship, they are stopped by the strike team. Master Solok takes a metal leg to the face while June Fan is blocking. Plo rushes forward to push him back, as a force blast by Savage sent troops flying off the landing pad. Blow moves to the Yellow Beast while the Red Demon threw his saber at the martial artist, who easily dodged it, only to see that it was intended for Solok. Plo takes a kick to the face, the young master goes into a frenzy, locking up the Sith and trying to pin him, while even more clones are killed. And the sheer strength of the Night Sisters' creations was overwhelming Plo. Maul delivered his clawed foot into the chest of the human, and the leader of this team had been beaten, dropping down as Savage ripped off his mask. The Type 1 atmosphere needed for most species was rapidly killing the Keldor, burning away the soft tissue in his nose, mouth, and down into his throat, not just suffocating from the lack of Doran air, but actively being attacked by this air. Savage indulges in the Jedi's pain, waiting for some time as Plo fought for his life. And just as the Red Blade was about to come down upon him, laser cannon fire rained down from above. Sensing that it was Kenobi, Maul is now the brother that needs to be restrained, and Savage is able to get them back to their ship in time to escape. Anakin and Kenobi go to deliver first aid, getting Plo's mask back on, and they see that Jun Fan is mortally wounded. His last words are to his friend, saying this is one mystery he will explore before Plo. The Master wishes him a safe journey, and they all can sense he had become one with the Force. From here, Plo would be off to Foros to push back the CIS invasion of this odd and ancient world. He brought with him Padawan Ahsoka and her close friend Barriss Afi. Plo trusted them to carry out their own mission, which led them to discover an underworld full of the tiny Ru people, worshipping in their hidden temple, praying for an end to the fighting above. They are able to convince the Ru to come with them for a safe passage off-world, only for their transport to be shot down, killing all the Ru on board. As Ahsoka helps her friend out of the wreckage, Barriss is in tears thinking about how the Jedi's war had brought destruction to so many planets across the galaxy. Dooku himself being just another Jedi after all. Ahsoka tells her not to let into her feelings of anger, fear, and hate. But she asks, what about guilt? The great telepathic ability of Master Plo must have picked up on these feelings, and knew that she wasn't the only one with this sentiment. One of the greatest archivists in the history of the Order, a fellow Keldor named Jedi Master Nos Doral, made sure to preserve the history of the Jedi and origins of the division that led to the Sith, and the empires that waged wars for thousands of years during the Old Republic era. Master Pong Krell shocked the Order with his treason during the Battle of Umbara, but this was just the latest in the history of the Jedi's existence that had been convinced by a time of war that the Jedi were too weak to defeat evil, and their supposed ethics only resulted in longer wars, more suffering, and never a complete eradication of darkness. Plo would wonder how many Jedi would fall down this corrupted line of thinking, the wish to use the dark side to do good, and the delusion of the benevolent dictator that had corrupted the greatest in their order, from Revan up through Dooku, and was flaring up in the Padawans of this era, and even the Chosen One himself. Perhaps to ensure that he could get a feel for Ahsoka's feelings towards the war, and the Jedi Order, he has Barriss sent back to Coruscant, but takes forces with Tano to the Dug world of Malastair. Republic Intelligence had reported a small group of Separatists carrying out some clandestine project on this planet, using heavily cloaked commandos to secure something of value. They suspected that their goal was to weaponize the Zillow Beast. Plo tells Soka to imagine the damage a pack of these could do to Coruscant if the enemy was able to find another sample and clone them. As they walk through the thick jungle, they lose contact with some of the men and find them dead and wrapped up in the vines. 
Plo warns them that this is not droid handiwork. But another threat lurks out here in the moonlit night. As they near a clearing, they see a massive Zillow Beast statue crafted from the metal of a scrapped droid command ship that was leading the operations in the uncharted part of the jungle. The Doug tribe that did this spots the strike team and seems to not understand Galactic Basic. Plo thinks they were one of the uncontacted tribes, and they were simply trying to defend their native lands. Ahsoka points out that their weapons were tipped with Zillow Beast's teeth, saying that they had no choice but to fight back. While Plo retorts, there is always a choice, Padawan. Steal your mind and you will see it. Then she thinks to search through the scrap sculpture for the ship's engine, and with the touch of a lightsaber, the entire thing explodes, cracking the earth, and as she fell into the cavern, Plo grabs hold of her just in time, bringing her up to safety, only to see that a massive droid force had moved in on them. The Dugs were dead, but now they were trapped. As the droids calculate how to take them in alive, the comms officer is able to contact Anakin. He and Kenobi were currently being chased by Cad Bane, taking heavy fire in their Charger C-70. But despite his master's worries, Anakin is able to get their hyperdrive back online, and are able to make a rapid descent through the Malastare atmosphere, expecting to see a massive battle, but finding only heaps of scrap droids. Kenobi asks what happened, and Plo only gives a sly response that being outgunned never stopped them before. Of course, he could never be sure what lay in the future for any Jedi, and what darkness lurked in their hearts. But fighting alongside her in such an intense battle, he did feel that little Soka was still walking in the light. But it would be the High Council that would make the next move into darkness, developing their most controversial plan to date, to fake the death of Obi-Wan Kenobi and impersonate the assassin Moralo Evol, a man believed to be the mastermind behind a credible plot against the Supreme Chancellor. Only the High Council was aware of this, and they would have to lie to the entire Order, Republic officials, and the public about the death of this famed hero of the Clone Wars. Deception at this level was hard to justify, but this late in the war, with billions killed, and with threats that could easily force a Republic surrender being picked up by both military and Jedi intelligence networks, they felt this was the only option they had. Anakin Skywalker would be pushed closer to the dark side than ever before, and his Padawan was concerned. I'm worried about Anakin. He hasn't said a word since it happened. Plo doesn't say a word, likely finding it hard to lie to little Soka, knowing she loved Kenobi as well. Eventually, Skywalker would track down what he thought to be the assassin, only to sense his master was alive, and Yoda would bring him in on the plan. Wasn't long before Ahsoka was told as well, and they would all play a part in foiling the greatest attempt on Palpatine's life since the war started. If it wasn't for Kenobi being undercover, they all felt the Supreme Chancellor would have been captured or killed. And when the dust settled and they were back on Coruscant, the meditations would probe the question of the efficacy of deception in doing good. But was this just a trick of the dark side? Years ago, he warned clones that evil didn't care what name you called yourself. It didn't care if the rulers of the galaxy were Republic or Separatist. The dark side just wanted to be embodied in the actions of as many people as possible. Plo wondered if this thought had infected the High Council. And a few weeks later, the concern of a growing darkness manifested itself in one of the worst ways imaginable. Bob, the temple hangar, someone has. Your assistance to fight the terrorist, we need. Since Anakin and Ahsoka were two of the most trusted Jedi that were also off-world during the bombing, they were chosen to be the neutral investigators alongside the crime scene analysis droid, Russo. And Ahsoka was not seeing the darker accusation Windu was hinting at. Everything is on the table. We have to look at the possibility that it could have been anyone in the temple, even a Jedi. Their investigation reveals that nano droids were used in the bombing, and they think that they had a prime suspect. Jakar, a man that was responsible for managing the explosive ordnance that was stored and loaded in the temple hangar. When they report their findings that evening, Mace explains that the Republic investigators will be getting involved since the attack killed civilians and clones working in the hangar. When Russo realizes that the nanodroids were in Jakar's body, that he was the bomb, they head out to his home to see if they could find more info, and it is revealed that his wife Leta was behind it. The report also cleared any Jedi involvement, but Windu and Ahsoka are both more troubled by the fact that it wasn't that unreasonable to think another Jedi could have fallen, and that public resistance to the war was bubbling up to the point of terrorist attacks in these hallowed halls. But for now, they had to prepare for the funeral. Luminous beings are we. But temporary vessels, our bodies are. After the burial, Plo is with Mace and Yoda talking to Chancellor Palpatine, while Ahsoka learns that Leta had been moved to Republic custody. Shortly after this, Tarkin informs the Council that Leta will only speak with Ahsoka Tano. 
They're all confused by this, but she wanted to do whatever she could to help the investigation. Commander Fox watches the cams as the Padawan apparently used the force to strangle the prisoner. With blasters drawn, the clones rush in, finding Leta dead and taking Tano into custody. Can't say I blame you, Commander Tano, but all the same, you're under arrest. It wasn't long before Tarkin showed up to interrogate the girl that, to him, symbolized everything wrong with the Jedi Order being meshed with the leaders of the military. The fact that a young, reckless, alien girl like this outranked him was outrageous. Anakin was being held up at the main gate, furiously demanding that he be able to see his Padawan, no matter what orders Tarkin gave against accepting visitors. He returns with Rex to help sway the commander, and as they arrive, they hear calm chatter that Ahsoka had escaped, and several clones were killed in the process. She's killed troopers! I know Commander Tano. She would never do something like this. Anakin demanded that they do not shoot to kill, and they spread out to make sure she can't get off the grounds of the naval HQ. Blaster fire erupted near the first battle memorial, and Anakin reiterates that their weapons better be set to stun. They nearly trap her at the refinery, and Anakin does catch up to her in the sewers, but she did not believe even her master could save her from what she claimed to be a grand conspiracy to frame her. The storm that raged outside mirrored the emotions swirling in the minds of all in the High Council chamber. Tarkin spun a story of how Ahsoka must have used mind tricks on the guards before killing them, and while it was the only obvious way to explain the evidence, many were still unconvinced. I do not believe that Ahsoka could have fallen so far. The choice of who would be best to track her down was obvious. Master Skywalker and Master Plo Koon, with clones, you will go. Mace worries that Anakin will not be able to act objectively. Obi-Wan and Yoda push that despite this, Anakin both knows her best and would be most able to convince her to turn herself in. The LAAT-LE gunships were loaded with Commanders Wolf and Rex, along with two squads of the Coruscant Guard. The All Points Bulletin issued to the lower level authorities was spread out to every corner, and the now bounty hunter Ventress was eager to cash in on this pouncing on her prey and putting her blade to the Togruta's throat. She explains that she will sell the bounty off to a broker so that they can turn her in, knowing that Ventress wouldn't be able to turn herself in without also being arrested. Chano says that they should make a deal, that there is a larger plot behind this, one that must involve Dooku's new apprentice, Ventress's replacement, and so if she helps Ahsoka figure out the real Jedi behind this, she could foil Dooku's plans and earn herself a pardon. But as they discuss this on the landing pad, Plo sees for himself that the fugitive Padawan was with the Sith Assassin, one very capable of orchestrating the temple attack, murder of Leta, and prison break. As Anakin runs out to meet them, it seems like they were a pair, Ventress even placing a comforting hand on her shoulder before they run away. The probes track them down, and Wolf's squad ambush them and plead with her to come in alive. Ventress takes initiative and slices through their blasters and leaves others unconscious. Ahsoka takes the other half, but they make sure they kill no one. As Wolf recovers, he relays this to the generals, and it all seems to prove Tarkin's theory. They would be lost for a few hours, but they scramble to an old warehouse where the local police reported a massive explosion. When they arrive, Commander Wolf doesn't say a word. He immediately fires a stun bolt to take her down. And as Anakin runs to her side, the commander notices the crates were full of the same nano droids used in the bombing. She was put in cuffs and placed in the gunship, now with just Rex, Wolf, Anakin, and Plo. All her close friends, who had fought side by side with her for years, seen her bravery and compassion firsthand. When they make the call back to the council, Plo explains that she was detained in a warehouse full of explosives. And while Anakin sensed that there was something more to this, even he knew this looked bad and Plo calls on all his strength to remain neutral. I think there's more going on than we know. By Ahsoka, or against her. That remains to be seen. The following morning, Tarkin explains that the Chancellor is worried that an internal procedure within the Jedi Order will not seem objective in the eyes of the public. She should be exiled from the Order so that she can be tried in the military tribunal, with the charge of sedition against the Republic. Yoda decides that they will conduct their own trial first, and Plo is one of the judges, with his focus being on the question of the connection to Ventress. Which brings us to Ventress. Can you explain your association with her? He knew if there was anything in the galaxy that could corrupt a Jedi, it would be a Sith. And it can snaps that this was just a show trial. They had already convicted her in their hearts. Plo was hurt to see him losing control, and compounding the sadness of this moment. Mace reads the guilty verdict, while Coyote Mundi strips her rank and explains how she will be transferred to the military. 
As Ahsoka was handed over to the military prisons, Anakin is able to hunt down Ventress and learns she made a call to Barriss Afi, who told her to meet in the warehouse. The High Council and many prominent senators would be witness to the military trial, hearing Tarkin's plea that a guilty verdict should come with the death penalty. As the trial goes on, Tarkin hammers on the point that she was associating with a Sith assassin war criminal. Meanwhile, Anakin had successfully pushed Barriss into drawing Ventress's stolen blades in order to escape. The fight would lead them all across the temple grounds, but he is able to take her prisoner, just in time to bring her before the trial to make a confession. The following hours were a mix of confusion, regret, relief, and bittersweet joy. We do not know how Plo voted during the Jedi trial. The fact that they were not in total agreement likely means that at least Plo and Obi-Wan were against her expulsion. Nonetheless, he knows that he did have his doubts and apologizes. You have our most humble apologies, little Soka. The Council was wrong to accuse you. They all welcome her back to the Order and are eager to put this behind them, but this incident shook her to her core. Plo could see that she did not fall to the dark, but felt that the Jedi Order had strayed from the light. She was no longer little Soka, and as she refuses her master's open hand and leaves the council chamber, Plo places an arm on Kenobi's shoulder, telling him not to run after his old Padawan, knowing that this moment needed to be between Anakin and his Padawan alone. Later, Anakin would confirm that she was not coming back, and the greatest mind reader in the galaxy would have sensed the great darkness rising in the Chosen One, and struggling to keep his tears in those stoic silver eyes. Months would pass, and Plo is charged with responding to a distress signal from the moon of Obadiah. A heavy sandstorm was shrouding the entire area, but eventually they find the wreckage of a T-6 Jedi shuttle, and inside, Plo picks up the long-lost saber of Sifo Diaz. The conversation in the High Council would lead them down a path that there was no coming back from. The lightsaber of Sifo Diaz, it is. Never found when he died, it was. He said he foresaw a great conflict, and that the Republic would need to raise an army. At the time, the Council rejected those ideas. Guide the creation of the clones from the beginning. Dooku did. Hmm. Our enemy created an army for us. Cover up this discovery. We must. While they discuss the issue of the clone army creation, Plo notices Yoda is distracted. But what could be more pressing than this? Earlier that day, he had a profound experience with a voice that claimed to be Qui-Gon Jinn. Yoda speaks to Anakin about the conversation he had with what seemed to be the spirit of Qui-Gon, admitting he was not sure what to make of this. Later, he decided to tell the Council what he was struggling to understand. Send something that I have not before. Impossible, it seems. Trust my feelings. I do not. And to try and understand this mystery, Plo and the rest of the entire Council placed their hands on Yoda for a group meditation that would last more than a day. But they heard nothing. Then they run a full battery of tests three times over, but find nothing physically wrong with Yoda. So Plo Koon arrives to help with the sensory deprivation procedure. The chamber works to deprive the patient of any stimulation except from within. Master Yoda will be taken into an induced meditation. This allows the patient to go deeper than anything we can achieve by ourselves. This technique was introduced to the Jedi Order by the ancient Keldor Jedi of the Old Republic. Just like the Baron Do sages back on Doran, the native force worshippers of his people would go through long periods of sensory deprivation and then sensory overload, trying to maintain their focus on the force in each setting. He did contact Qui-Gon again, but Master Jin told him to stop this artificial process and showed him where to go in the galaxy to learn the secret of surviving bodily death from a natural force nexus. Anakin helps him escape, and the adventure would take him to Dagobah, then the Living Force Nexus, and off to Moraband, ending with a fight with Darth Sidious. But when he arrived back at the temple, he knew that the fate of the galaxy was, and always had been, in the hands of the Force itself, operating in a way that could not be articulated. Afraid. Not much there is to say of my journey. Plo Koon would not be brought in on the techniques of meditation that could help one retain their consciousness after bodily death. And though the Old Republic archivists like Master Nostaral surely recorded claims from both Jedi, Sith, and other Force traditions that all claimed to do this, it is not known to be a part of the Force cults back on his homeworld of Doran, and was only reintroduced via Qui-Gon, though time would show that no one was ever truly lost on the other side. In what would prove to be the final months of the Clone Wars, Plo was sitting with the Council viewing a transmission from Master Chubor, showing all of the refugee ships leaving Ma Rainey being shot down by Separatist forces, killing the Jedi and thousands of innocent civilians. For almost three standard years, this war has raged. 
said Plo Koon. We can barely even count the numbers of the fallen. But this... He shook his head. He even pointed out the hypocrisy of the Order, the supposed peaceful meditative monks whose reputation was being completely replaced in the public as a branch of the military. The Force wasn't seen as some great mystery, but a great weapon used by one side, with the Separatists having plenty of valid claims to their side, and the Jedi understood that their army was gifted to them by the Sith Lord they had been fighting, one who had been a model Jedi for decades previously. The Jedi knew they were not morally perfect in this war, and Plo had lost what felt like a family member when Ahsoka walked away over similar issues. Tarkin and Anakin would have been vindicated hearing what Mace Windu said next. Cut off the head, and the body will fall. Assassination, mean you? To the dark side, such actions lead. No one here wishes to behave like a Sith Lord. Few do, at first. This was a point Plo had been hearing since his days with the Devil Dogs. He was once concerned with always fighting in the honorable Jedi way, but as billions of innocent people died during these last months alone, during Operation Dirge's Lance, and now with the Outer Rim sieges purging entire worlds, now it seemed unethical to put anything above putting an end to the Sith threat. They suggested sending the unconventional underworld expert Quinlan Voss to work with Ventress in assassinating Count Dooku. She would get her revenge, enough credits to last a lifetime, and a full pardon, ending the war and letting her define her future however she wanted. This mission was deep undercover, and months would pass without any update, until one day they see Kenobi escorting Ventress through the Jedi Temple to speak directly with the High Council. As soon as Plo saw her, his hand went to his blade, but Obi-Wan convinced them to listen to her story. Did you teach Voss the ways of the Sith? Asked Plo Koon. Not as such. They learned that Taurus was about to be attacked next. The irony of the Force on how it rhymed was not lost on them. Being one of the most infamous attacks by Darth Malak thousands of years ago. A Jedi who fell to the dark side in a war that set the galaxy ablaze and killed billions of civilians in what was always at its core a civil war between Force wielders. As Kenobi helped Ventress track down and rendezvous with Voss, and the Master was convinced that Voss was only biding his time pretending to serve Dooku to gain his trust, he leaked useful intel and even found ways to work with Kenobi on some short missions destroying CIS assets, before returning to his role as an undercover agent. But some of these details were still suspicious, and eventually Kenobi agreed with Yoda and Mace that Voss had truly fallen to the dark side, becoming a double agent and working to bring about a Separatist victory. Plo and Kaidi Mundi were called in for an emergency session of the Council, and there was a near unanimous decision to execute their fallen brother. I think we need to seriously entertain the possibility of execution. Perhaps if Voss sees the Count again and has a chance to assassinate him, he'll be able to resist the dark side. He could redeem himself, come back from it. Isn't that what we really want? Or are we all just looking for sport? That is untrue, and you know it, Master Kenobi, chided Plo Koon. This may have seemed uncharacteristically cold for Master Plo, but Kenobi would not have known about Plo Koon's own struggles with the call to forbidden powers, and that the Keldor had been able to completely master these feelings. He was a master of one of the rarest Force abilities of all, a light side power move called Electric Judgment. He first used this in a mission shortly after the death of his master, Taivaka. His report would be sealed long before Kenobi became a master, but Windu, Yoda, and many of the others currently sitting on the council were in those same seats at the time, knowing his past and helping him keep this a secret. A secret that was only eventually revealed by Luke Skywalker when he was trying to restore the Jedi Order. Blow had been tracking a notorious criminal named Pommel, and the man was able to sense the Jedi despite his best efforts at stealth. He saw the dead bodies of the family members butchered on the floor the mother, father, and siblings of the five-year-old girl that was crying in the thug's hands. Pommel put a blaster to her head, using her to keep Plo back while he made his way to his ship. Plo reports that at that moment, he had no doubt the girl would be killed once Pommel escaped. I believe I acted entirely instinctively when I extended my right arm toward Pommel and released a barrage of lightning. He added that he knew of Force Lightning from the general study all received in the temple, but did no specialized training or have any interest in it. But once unleashed, he did feel he had an innate ability in this power. When he sent out those yellow bolts of electricity, he felt no fear or anger. The first bolt shot Pommel's hands out to his sides, releasing the blaster and the girl, and Plo hit him with another charge to make him go unconscious, but claimed to feel no urge to snuff out the man's life with a third bolt. 
The council wanted to consider this event before admitting him to the seat on the council that his late master had recommended him for, and after long meditation, he claimed he still felt he was able to keep his mind from wandering over into the dark side. He had no interest to learn of Force Lightning, but did think that if he had this unique ability, he should train his electric judgment. Even going on the offensive, and saying the only person who should judge whether or not it was a good or evil ability was the five-year-old girl giving the council the girl's new address if they wanted to stop meditating and go speak to her personally. The council would believe Plo, and eventually allow him to develop this ability further, but did require that it be kept a secret from all in the Jedi Order, even to the later members of the council. Only those active at the time of this event knew of it, while it was also recorded on the Great Holocron. This was an intelligent device that would restrict information to only those who were able to process it, those at the right time and with enough skill. That was the level of precaution against an ability that wasn't even of the dark side, it was just close enough to be troubling, and at a time before they even believed the Sith were still in the galaxy. So hearing that a powerful master like Voss was actively training with Sith Lord Dooku at the bloodiest peak of the war, this was simply an unacceptable risk. Only Kenobi held out that they need to give him one more chance without revealing that they knew he was a double agent, and to just orchestrate one more opportunity to assassinate Dooku. During this mission, Voss was forced to show that he had fallen. As Kenobi's strike team closed in on the Count, he helped his Sith Master kill Jedi Knights Desh and Bayans. But when Ventress succumbed to the Sith Lightning, the final looks from his tortured lover helped bring him back to the light, dropping his saber and giving up the fight, letting Kenobi and Skywalker take him in. This turn at the end of the fight weighed heavy on the Council, knowing how dangerous it would be if he was lying again. Seeing how the darkness had corrupted and destroyed their brother helped them see how close they had come to giving up on their values, and they swore not to execute him, but did make Quinlan stay alongside Yoda, essentially being reduced to a humble Padawan. Voss was scared of himself, perhaps even more than those around him, and was tormented every day by his temporary fall. Plo and the others eventually trusted him enough to let Kenobi act as his chaperone, and even travel off-world to Dathomir to visit Ventress's grave. Ahsoka was gone, the Sith assassin was dead, and they watched as one of their own fell into the dark side during a risky and ethically questionable mission that they, the High Council, had planned. Days later, they would finally see the death of Count Dooku as Skywalker severed the traitor's head over Coruscant. Plo was securing Kato Nymordia in what all were hoping could be the final fight of the Clone Wars. With the 442nd Siege Battalion, he was able to keep the purse world of the Nymordians firmly in Republic hands, a major financial blow to the Separatists that would surely force a surrender even if Grievous was never captured or killed. For now, he would have to sit in via Hollow to hear the troubling overstep by the Supreme Chancellor, who demanded that Anakin be placed on the Council as Palpatine's personal representative. Though they felt they had no choice, it was unprecedented and against their ancient practice. But it would help quiet the concerns that the Jedi were corrupt and becoming a dictatorship, leading the war without true representation from the public. How can you be on the Council and not be a master? Take a seat, young Skywalker. Plo had been there when Skywalker was just a young boy, pressing the order to make the most difficult decision of their era, and these outbursts were not taken lightly. The young man did obey Master Windu, and they moved on to assign Kenobi to track down Grievous on Utapau. The next few days would be spent on Kato Nymordia, and he likely got word that Grievous had been killed. Rumors must have spread that now they would have peace. Calm day, he would be carrying out a routine patrol in his beloved ship, the Blade of Doran, that old gift from an eager young Skywalker, at the time unaware that his friend had fallen to the true Sith Lord behind this war. His unshielded Delta-7 started taking hits from the powerful cannons on a pair of ARC-170s. In just a few seconds, the Master was consumed in an explosion as he collided with the Hanging City. All those narrow escapes over the course of his life as a Jedi, the threats from beasts, the battle droids, and Sith Lords, his ultimate fall came at a moment that he would least suspect. From his friend, CT-5511, Jag. In this bodily form, there wouldn't have been much time to piece it all together. The concerns with the Chancellor, the issue of the hidden Sith Master to Dooku, the unbelievable claims of Fives, and the secret army being built for them all those years ago. But perhaps he could have seen it all from the Force point of view, if only just for a moment, before dissolving into that great source of all life in the galaxy, becoming one with the Force. His memory would live on in countless beings across the galaxy. Those sparks of the Force spread throughout the stars, glowing through lowly matter and their dark and base surroundings, like that beauty found in a wild beast, or fine art in a dictator's palace. 
Blow had always found a way to focus on the light breaking through the darkness, on the people that he had met, laughing in the face of death countless times, seeing the war as secondary and consequential to the true mission of connecting with and loving those around him. In the few moments Darth Vader would think about the life of Anakin, he would avoid the memory of the Keldor Sage. Shakun would be killed by the Fallen One's cyborg hand, his own niece being killed by that little boy that he had once voted to exclude from the Jedi Order. But surely, from this Force point of view, he could see with greater wisdom, as he knew that he did love Anakin. He had supported Obi-Wan once he vowed to honor Qui-Gon's dying wishes, and knew that nobody, not even Anakin, was ever truly lost. Meanwhile, little Soka, now a grown woman, fleeing Inquisitors in a galaxy consumed by the dark side, was making Plo proud, putting individuals first, saving humble families on obscure worlds, seeing them as no less important than the high-value VIPs from the times of the Clone Wars. She would outlive Darth Sidious and his empire, never giving up on those in need, soaring the galaxy in that old T-6 Clone Wars era shuttle, perhaps even the same one she and Plo had used together during their shared time on this mortal plane of the Living Force. That's it for the complete life of Plo Koon. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, leave a comment, and share the video. These are the best ways to help me out. Subscribe so you don't miss other series like this. I want to cover everything eventually. But most important of all, remember, you can laugh in the face of death when you know that no one is ever truly gone. And the Force will be with you. Always.